And welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author and old friend, Father Dwight Longnecker, his book There and Back Again, a somewhat religious odyssey published by Ignatius Press, naturally available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com for all things Catholic. Always a pleasure to speak with Thanks. you. Good to see you again. We tried to get together uh, during the summer at a conference and, and get the book done, but we weren't able to get it. So it was great that we were able to work this out. Uh, there and back again, a somewhat religious odyssey. Why is it somewhat? Well, uh, you know, a good number of converts have written their stories and they make for inspiring reading and uh, very instructional reading regarding the theological points of becoming a Catholic from the Protestant denominations. And I'd covered a lot of that territory in some of my other books, so I wanted to write a more personal story, an autobiography, but also tell my conversion story. So therefore, right. somewhat religious, not totally religious. Right. Now, in the beginning, you use a quote by St. John Henry Newman, God has created me to do him some definite service. He has committed some work to me which he has not committed to another. I have my mission. I may never know what it is in this life, but I shall be told in the next. Do you have any inkling now? Or are you still not sure what your mission no, is? No, I think I, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones in that it came clear to me what I should be doing and what God's call for me was. Mm -hmm. And I reference John, uh, St. John Henry Newman because right. as an Anglican uh, convert to Catholicism, and also a lot of people may not realize this, uh, like me, he was actually brought up in an evangelical Protestant home. Mm -hmm. uh, in his youth, he used to go out and hand out tracts and so forth and, and do very evangelical type things. And uh, so he's always been yeah, a great influence on me, and I wanted to use that special quote, which is very moving, um, there at the front of the book. Right, you actually, and Steve Ray, well known to EW10, of course, uh, wrote uh, like a forward to it. And, and it's interesting because later on you talk about this the importance of the famous Jack Van Impey. Yes, that's and right. And Rexella, of course. Yes. And that announcer had a fabulous voice. But it was important to your family growing up, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, when I was growing up, this would have been in the um, late 60s, early 70s, Jack Van Impey was actually out uh, as, a, as a traveling evangelist. He would come to churches and, and do his evangelistic rallies, speaking in churches, and visited our church a couple of times. I think he went on from then to have a, a significant television well, and radio Absolutely. ministry, but he at did. that time he was still out on the road um, preaching and teaching mm -hmm. in various churches. Right, and, and you break down actually uh, your various uh, journey basically by the towns or areas you lived in in different That's times right. in life, right? Yeah. Uh, I thought it was interesting too because uh, one of the things Steve Ray points out that he explains, he, 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 he says, you explain serious matters in a lighthearted manner that makes them enjoyable and equally understandable. Why did you decide to take that? That, that approach. <laughs> well, you know, a couple of reasons. First of all, um, I wanted the book, to, the book to be entertaining and, and a good read, and most people said, yeah, I couldn't put it down. It was really interesting and it was fun to read. Um, and also, but for a more serious reason, I realized in my writing, especially in learning how to write fiction and drama, that there are certain things which open the human heart. Music opens the human heart. Um, tragedy and pathos um, and compassion opens the human heart, but humor also opens the human right. heart. Um, when a person laughs, they let down their guard. Mm -hmm. When they laugh and see a joke, um, they're actually open to the truth. And so, um, what do they say? Many, many truths are spoken in jest. Right. Well, therefore, um, I wanted to use some humor to sort of keep things light, but also to keep the reader's heart open to what I was trying to say. Now, in the introduction, you talk about the fact that many times people have come to you about your conversion story, when are you going to write your book, etc. Uh, and you said, I was always been flattered, but joked, I haven't written it because too many of the guilty are still living, yes. including you. Yeah, that's right. What did you mean? Well, you know, uh, I, as the story unfolds in the book, you'll see that there are a good number of people who um, profess to be Christians, but actually are hypocrites, and they, um, they stumble and they fall, mm -hmm. and um, they have sin in their lives, which is one of the realities of trying to follow the Lord Jesus, that we're all sinners. Uh, and I'm in, that, I'm in that club as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, I tried not to make the story especially uh, overly pious or overly sort of, that's why I say somewhat religious. You, you tried to write at one time that you, uh, something, right, <laughs> that you decided was overly pious, right? And yeah, you kind of trashed I, it. I was inspired by Thomas Merton's famous um, conversion story and okay. probably also by John Henry Newman's, um, which were very religious. Right. Um, and. I began writing it, and after two or three chapters, I gave up because it was right. it, it was too it was too religious, if you see what I mean. Did I and did I misunderstand you? Too overly your, serious about myself. Did I misunderstand your allusion to Merton? Do you think he became a Buddhist in the end? 
he did end up as a, well, not as a Buddhist, but he certainly... He was um, heavily into Buddhism, yeah. right? Yeah. He, he was heavily influenced by Eastern religions right. in the end. Yeah, yeah. Was, I, I figured that's what you were mm -hmm. relating to. Now, you say I'm essentially a private person. I'm an introvert and always been expert in donning a mask. What, what's the mask you always wear or used to wear? Because your mask change over time. Uh, <laughs> I'm really interested in the psychology of religion and the psychology of religious people. And I'm aware that, um, well, when I'm a priest, I have to put on the priest's uniform every day. Mm -hmm. um, and when I celebrate Mass, I put on all my vestments. And therefore, we have to assume the costumes uh, and therefore the persona of a religious person and a pious person. Uh, and I hope I'm serious about my faith, and I hope I'm pious to, right. to in the right way. Right. But um, this can sometimes become a mask for people um, where their insecurities and their sinfulness right. is hiding behind that, that, that mask or that uniform, uh, and that's a serious right. trouble. Well, you're unusual because your parents went to Bob Jones University, and you yes. did too. Uh, are you still a snob? I hope not. Because <laughs> <laughs> the girls seem to accuse you of being a snob at the time, yeah. right? Several There's times. a story in there. When I was at Bob Jones, I came down with a serious illness called Anglophilia, which okay. is the love of all things English. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was interested in the arts. I was interested in um, England. I was interested in poetry and all that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And uh, in my college years, I guess that turned me into a bit of a snob. At least I was perceived that way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's one of the stories in the book about when I was at college. Mm -hmm. uh, I was entered into one of these date auctions, wow. and when my name came up, all the girls in the school said, ooh, he's a snob, <laughs> and I'm afraid they were right. No, there was some nice girl who liked you, who yeah. bid two bucks for you, I believe, as I recall. Uh, it, it's interesting, too, because the, the, the church that you belong to, you know, it was kind of an independent, evangelical kind of church or a fundamentalist church, and then when you got tied into Anglicanism, that was kind of an odd group, too, right? Yeah, that was the first sort of jump into, into the world of tradition and liturgy and the historic church. Uh, while I was at Bob Jones, we were permitted to go to a little church called the Holy Trinity Anglican Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. And this was part of a breakaway Anglican denomination, which had been founded in, I guess, the 19, late 1960s. Okay. And we were permitted to go there um, because the founder was a friend of Bob Jones and uh, one of the people who was on the board at Bob Jones was also a member of this little church. So we were allowed to go to this Anglican church, and that's where my, Anglo, my Anglophilia, or love of all things English, sort of clicked into high gear. Right. And, and, and you were actually born in the States, right? Like Pottstown? Oh, yeah. I was brought up in Pennsylvania. No, but I mean, people hear you speak, and they think, well, you must have been born in England. Yeah. I, I don't think my accent's so English anymore, but certainly when I was over there, it went pretty English. Right. Yep. It's English enough. I think it sounds that way still. <laughs> you can still hear it. It's interesting, too. So is U.S., is the United States a shire in England, Modor, or is it reversed? Well, the title there and back again refers right. to Tolkien's uh, book, The Hobbit, uh, and in The Lord of the Rings, of course, which is the sequel to The Hobbit, uh, the hobbits go to Mordor, and then they return to the Shire, mm -hmm. uh, and Mordor is the land of evil. So there and back again in the Tolkien legendarium means uh, going from the Shire to Mordor and coming back again. Okay. Well. My shire, therefore, must have been the USA, okay. and Mordor must have been England. But in many ways, of course, that's back to front, because England is like the shire. Right. Yeah, that was the idea, right? You say we, no, we are not to put our tent pegs in too deep. What do you mean? Well, my story has been one of um, being, going there and back again, um, moving from one place to another and following the Lord's guidance and the Lord's leading. And this is one of the themes that um, has really motivated me um, in my spiritual life, mm -hmm. seeing the spiritual life as being a journey, that God chooses no, uh, a tribe of nomads at the very beginning, um, that Abraham and his family are travelers in the wilderness. Moses leads the people out of Egypt to the, through the wilderness to the Promised Land. There's always this sense of moving on and not putting your tent pegs too deep means I'm not going to stay in this mm -hmm. place too very long. And that's also a metaphor for our spiritual life because we're going to die one day. Right. And therefore, this life here is always temporary. We're not to um, invest in right. the worldly things too much. It kind of always reminds me of the transfiguration. Hey, let's hang out here, build tents. Nope. Yeah. That's not how it works. You can be prepared to do something else. Yeah, you need to go back down the mountain and get real. That's why you were here, yeah. so you could deal with what you're going to deal with. Yeah. Uh, you have some great stories about your grandparents and your parents. Uh, I thought that you say that Grammy Keene was an absolute brick. What does that mean? 
Uh, that's probably <laughs> that's probably a, uh, an English reference, which is creeping into my story. Okay. An absolute brick in England means um, a solid, dependable, sturdy, mm -hmm. um, reliable, loyal sort of person. In uh, chapter two, when you're in Ridgewood, you say all happy. You use the quote from Tolstoy: "All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way." You said, "I think our family was happy, but we were certainly not like every other family. In fact, I learned pretty early on that we were very unlike every other family. In fact, we were weird. One of the things, I guess, that was kind of weird was the fact that you didn't have a TV, right? <laughs> right. Here I am sitting in a TV studio, right? And my mom chose not to have a TV for our family, and. As kids, we didn't think too much about it, except mm -hmm. we kind of graded against it when we went to visit friends and family, and they did have TV. We'd sit down and we'd be all goggle-eyed and watch the TV the whole time. Um, but I'm grateful for that now right. because we read a lot. Right. Um, we had lots of books. We went to the library every week, and um, Mom made sure that we had lots of reading material, yeah. and we read and read and read again. Well, you can watch Mr. Ed in reruns now, so you, you can catch up on stuff you missed out on. <laughs> now, you talk about having this kind of supernatural Twilight Zone level experience with your family in a car, and, and the idea that it was important to you and your family because you believed in miracles. Explain. Yeah. You know, all through my life, from, right from the age of about three or four, um, I've experienced some really remarkable, I suppose, miracles or mystical experiences, um, wonderful things that have happened. And one of those was actually not something that I remember, but which my parents, a story my parents told. Okay. They were coming home from the youth group that they were leading, uh, and Dad was driving the station wagon, and me and my older brother and sister were asleep in the back. They put the seats down. We were asleep in the back. And he's coming down a lane um, with steep banks on either side, a, n a narrow country lane, and he goes over the crest of a hill, and he sees another car coming at high speed in the other direction. And they knew that as they went down to the next dip, that car, that driver would not be able to see them. So there th was no place to go. So they continued on, and my mom says, Sure enough, the car came over the brow of the next hill at high speed, and we saw in our headlights the terrified face of the other driver as he was prepared to, for the head-on collision, which would certainly have killed all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and then my mom and dad said, it was like they don't know what happened, but my dad looked in the rearview mirror and saw the other car's taillights receding down in the other direction. It was like the two cars had dematerialized right. and gone through one through another without actually any damage being done. Uh, and this was an extraordinary miracle, which my parents would relate to us as kids and to their, anybody who was interested, um, where we were spared from um, almost certain right. death by a, by a wonderful miracle. Right. Part of the mission, like you say, uh, uh, I, I do know that there's a providential plan, as we alluded to before in this world, that we can only see partially. And you talk about a keyhole in paintings by people like uh, Rubens. What do you mean? Explain. Yeah, the question comes up, therefore, if your family was delivered from this terrible accident, why isn't every family delivered from a terrible accident? I tell a story earlier about my grandfather who died in a, in a, with, when, a when a coal truck crushed him, um, and he was um, taken to hospital and, and died soon after. He saw angels, right? And, and saw angels when right. he passed. Another beautiful uh, miracle story, but he wasn't delivered from death. Um, and so. I'm trying to explain this mystery, and I'll say I think it's because we only see things partially. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like we're looking through a keyhole onto some right. v vast and wonderful um, pa uh, panoramic painting of, say, a great battle or something. But through the keyhole, we can only see part of what's what's going right. on. We can't see the whole scene yeah, through a glass darkly. Sometimes, yeah, people do yeah. Say so, that. and maybe that's a good title for a book: Through yeah. a Keyhole. Right there, you go. Yeah. Now, yeah. What's the deal with T. S. Eliot? <laughs> yeah, in that chapter when I talk about our family being weird, I talk about some of the weird experiences I had as a child. Because we read a lot, um, my dad had one of those, bought us one of those sets of the old world book encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. You might remember them. Sure. With their green and white bindings. We had the whole set on the bookshelf. And every year we would get the world book uh, annual, which came out in, I suppose, sometime in the summer, summarizing um, the events of the previous year, mm -hmm. news-wise. And so I'm about nine years old, and I can remember, still remember clearly, reading the, the um, obituary of T.S. Eliot, who died in 1965, and reading how he went to England, became a poet, lived over there, and I thought that would be marvelous to be able to do something like that. I would love to go and live in England mm -hmm. and be a writer. Right, that's, that's uh, key. <laughs> now, uh, did you actually win the Presidential Physical Fitness Award? or? Uh, no, I'm afraid not. When you were in Shillington, no? 
Presidential Physical Fitness Award was something which was started by President Kennedy. I remember. And it right. was all the kids in schools ha ha in school had to perform certain um, physical fitness right. uh, requirements to get them physically fit. You had to throw a softball and climb a rope and do so many push-ups and yeah. so forth. I don't think I did. No, you weren't. That wasn't really. You talked earlier uh, a little bit about the idea of hypocrites, and, and I thought this was the way you said this. You said. They were not hypocrites at all because our religion taught us that we were all sinners, meaning the people who fell. What was really hypocritical was to pretend we were not sinners, ultimately. Yeah. I think that sums it up. You know, as a young person growing up in the faith, you invariably come across church leaders and the people who are supposed to be the good Christians who stumble and fall. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe they fall into the sins of the flesh, maybe they fall into um, embezzlement of money, whatever it is, uh, they actually stumble and fall and they don't, they're not the good examples that you wish they were. Right. And so as a young person thinking about the faith, you've got to deal with that. Uh, and the way I dealt with it by was re realizing that actually our faith said that we would be sinners and we should expect that. It's a, it's a case of wrong expectations. Um, furthermore, I looked in the mirror and I realized I was a hypocrite too. So. Right. The real hypocrites are the ones who pretend that they're not hypocrites. Right. Okay. Because well, we're a hypocrite is basically an actor, somebody. Yeah. Who's it's like that, on it's like that old joke when the man says to the priest, "Father, I don't go to your church; it's full of hypocrites." And he says, "Well, why don't you come along anyway? We can always make room for one yeah. more." Yeah. Bishop Fulton Sheen was classic for years. Is it one of his? Was it? Okay. Now I don't know if he created it, but he used to say it. I, th I was happy to learn in the early age that it was possible. In fact, it was necessary to distinguish between Christian religion and Christians. It was necessary especially to distinguish between the flame of faith and the keepers of the flame. And I thought that was interesting too because later on as we jumped to your time at Oxford and Cambridge and when you actually became an Anglican priest and uh, the bishop who ordained you later had his own problems, didn't he? Yeah. Bishop Peter was it? Yeah, Bishop yeah. Peter Ball uh, was a very charismatic, very um, charming person uh, and I believe in his heart of hearts really wanted to be the monk that he pretended to be right, okay. or that he is that persona that he assumed there again we're talking about the mask or the costume he wore his monastic robes he presented himself as a Franciscan type of monk uh, but he was later jailed for um, molesting young men right he had a kind of a strange thing that you talk about in the book we don't have to go into about uh, dealing with young men and, and anointing them and things like yeah. that he, he had a, a program where they would guys who were about 18 who had just left high school would spend a year, um, six months in his monastic community and then he would put, send them out to parishes in twos and threes to live uh, simply and to serve in the parish. It was a great idea and lots of people, lots of lives were touched and changed by it, mm -hmm. but within that sort of intimacy or close relationship with those young men he was misbehaving. All right. Now you talk about, to jump back to the Bob Jones University, you talk about uh, 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 the idea of, in fact, you got involved with smuggling Bibles in, into Eastern Europe, right? Yes. Uh, I found myself plunged into a reform school discipline and a dating scene that was a blend of the little house on the prairie and the scarlet letter, because uh, you had been a little freer as an, in the non-denominational kind of experience. You talk about the concept of laying on hands having different meanings for different people, right? <laughs> yeah. In my high school years, um, you know, I had a job, I had a motorcycle, I had a girlfriend, I had, a, my parents gave me a fair bit of freedom. Um, but when I went to Bob Jones, there was a lot of discipline, a lot of um, stuff. Discipline, a lot of it was good, but a lot of it was very focused on boy-girl relationships and it was very strict and that's why I said it, was, it felt like a blend between the Scarlet Letter and the Little House on the Prairie. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the girls were demure and modest, which is good, mm -hmm. um, but wasn't much excitement there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, it was, and they, they strictly regulated all the relationships, which had its good points, right. um, but it was also very restrictive compared to the high school years that I'd had where I'd had a fair bit of freedom. Right, okay. Uh, in Oxford, uh, you, you talk about being there. I said, I soon realized that the evangelical wing of the Church of England was practically Presbyterian in every way. The theology, most of the Wycliffe men, was a mild form of Calvinism. Uh, and you said they were Anglicans because they considered the Church of England, quote unquote, the best boat to fish from. What does that mean? Well, um, I went from um, Bob Jones to over to Oxford and studied at Wycliffe Hall, which is an evangelical or a low church um, Protestant. Because there's like three versions, right? Yes. There's high, broad, and low. Yeah, kind of and the low church is uh, 
part of the Church of England that is very Protestant in its theology and in its churchmanship and in its worship. So some of the pastors, for instance, in the Low Church, Anglican Church in England uh, wouldn't even wear vestments. They just wear, uh, uh, you know, a suit and tie to, 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 to officiate at their services. Mm -hmm. um, not the Eucharist, but at their morning prayer and evening prayer services and so forth. So it's very low, and that's why I say it's practically Presbyterian in every way. Mm -hmm. um, but they were evangelical, so they were concerned with winning souls. They were concerned with evangelization. I see. That's therefore, the and therefore, they considered the Anglican Church, the established church, to be the best boat to fish from. Well, were they fishing for to attract other Anglicans to the Low Church, or were they looking for people like Catholics or others outside there to bring them in? Both. Both. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I discovered that the theology of most Anglicans was a pleasant form of agnosticism, agnosticism that seemed at first glance uh, to be no more than a mild, polite syncretism. Yeah, uh, St. John Henry Newman talks about, uses the word latitudinarianism. Mm -hmm. And latitudinarianism is basically the, um, her I suppose, heresy in which a Christian group will accept almost any um, difference of opinion as long as you stay within the group. Mm -hmm. um, and Anglicanism is like that. It's latitudinarian. You can be low church and practic practically Presbyterian. You can be high church and practically um, Roman Catholic. You can have elements of orthodox spirituality. You can have elements of charismatic worship. You can have almost anything within that as long as you stay in the boat. Right. Now you, you had this experience as well where you trekked across Europe. And this, this is in the section on Jerusalem, but you say, I not only sensed the companionship of my guardian angel, but I grew in my understanding acceptance of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Why? Well, um, by this time I had, um, within the Anglican Church, become much more Catholic in my understanding of the sacraments and um, my priesthood, and also began to appreciate devotion to the Blessed Virgin. I'd gone to Walsingham in England, um, and I'd uh, gone to Cor Abbey on the Isle of Wight, which is dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Someone gave me a rosary. Mm -hmm. So in 1987, after my first job as an Anglican priest, I had three months free. Uh, and so I therefore made a pilgrimage from England to Jerusalem hitchhiking and staying in Benedictine monasteries all across France and Italy and so forth. Were those Catholic monasteries? Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, and as I walked along, um, I would pray the rosary um, and uh, so I began to have a much deeper appreciation for by the Catholic right. Church and for the Rosary and, and you, for the Blessed Virgin. And I know you visited one particular church, I forget the, which one it was, because you always talk about the feeling of God's presence in your life, and then you went into this Catholic Church and you felt a greater, even greater presence. Yeah, this was in the summer after my um, high school graduation. Mm -hmm. uh, I went with an evangelical mission team to Europe to smuggle Bibles into the That's Eastern right. Europe. Okay. And at the end of the trip, we were stationed in, in France, and then at the end of the trip, we took um, a bit of a tourist trip to Paris before flying home again. Uh, and all the rest of the kids were wandering around the streets of Montmartre in Paris. And there, of course, is the great Basilica of Sacré-Cœur to the Sacred Heart. Mm -hmm. And it was a summer evening. They sat on the steps there and overlooked the city lights of Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, I went into the church, and uh, for those who know the church, it's actually a place and has been a place for um, decades, for centuries now, of perpetual Eucharistic adoration. Okay. They have a great huge monstrance in there for Eucharistic Yeah, you didn't generation. realize quite what it was at the time. I didn't right? know what it was. It was right. just a beautiful big church. It was dark and there were right. candles, candlelight right. everywhere. And I just sat there in the silence but felt God's presence. presence. And I didn't know what it was that I was actually there for. You say, two years at King's, uh, that was King's College, right, opened my eyes to the reality of the Church of England. The Dean of Chapel was a modernist theologian who wrote books with pretentious titles like The Dazzling Darkness. You say that, uh, he epitomized that quip from the uh, English sitcom, Yes, Prime Minister, that the perfect Anglican clergyman was a blend of a socialite and a socialist. <laughs> While the dean was an urbane theologian, the college chaplain was an open homosexual, and invitations to clergy meetings in Cambridge always included invitations for everyone's partner, quote unquote. Yeah. Um that pretty much summed up uh, the Anglican religion in Cambridge at the time. This is Cambridge. In, in, after I was uh, at seminary in Oxford, I had a job uh, as an assistant priest in a parish in Sussex in the southeast of England. And then this is when I went, did the trip to Jerusalem. And when I came back, I began as a chaplain in Cambridge. And that pretty much sums right. up the, the, the uh, religious temperature right. in Cambridge at the time. You say the fanciful understanding of Anglicanism is a, as a form of Catholicism is still very popular among certain Anglicans. 
uh, this idea that the Church of England was independent of Rome from the very earliest days when good old Henry VIII broke with the Pope. He was just restoring the ancient Christian Church in Britain that had always been independent of Rome. And then you go on to say Anglo-Catholicism is surely one of the most attractive fabricated forms of Christianity. That's pretty tough. Yeah, I guess it's a pretty severe judgment, but um, Anglo-Catholicism has um, is the uh, more Catholic expression of Anglicanism, and when I say that they've, it's the most beautiful fabricated form of religion, mm -hmm. they've taken um, Catholic spirituality, they've taken the beautiful buildings in England, the beautiful uh, ancient Catholic buildings in, buildings in England, the c churches and right. the cathedrals, they've um, maintained a beautiful musical tradition, a very beautiful artistic tradition, um, a very beautiful and intellectually aesthetic um, mm -hmm. theology. And so they put this all together into a very, very attractive form of Christianity, one which is very seductive. It was seductive to me right, and seductive to any young person who's thinking about the faith and looking at the faith and looking for liturgy, looking for beauty, looking for history, looking for tradition. Right. Smells and bells sometimes people would say would attract yeah, but people. But it's largely a, a confection. It's, it's a gathering together right. of all these beautiful things, if you like, treasures which actually are part of the Catholic Church, right. but they've sort of picked and chosen the things they like best and kept it. Right, kept it's got this tradition almost like a museum. Yeah, it was interesting, for instance, when I became a Catholic, I realized there was like 500 years of Christian history which was a blank to me mm -hmm. um, from the 16th century onward because the Anglicans had no appreciation or um, didn't really value some of the great saints of the Counter-Reformation, uh, some of the great spiritualities of the Counter-Reformation. Right. So the Jesuits and St. Francis Xavier, St. John Bosco, right. um, and so forth and so on, were just not on their radar at all. Okay, as far as your radar, another book in the works, or what are you thinking about? Um, Yes, but I'm a bit stuck right now. Okay. So I'm actually focusing more now on, on writing fiction and drama. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm working on a, uh, um, a comedy which is called Arsenic and Church Lace. Okay, okay. I like the original one. I hope I like this one as well. Thank you for Thanks very so much. much, Father Dwight Longnecker. Of course, the book there in a back again, a somewhat religious odyssey uh, worth uh, the checking out. It's published by Ignatius Press, available naturally through the EWTN Religious Catalog. I'm Doug Keck. We appreciate you joining us right here on EWTN's Bookmark.